Buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos nuevamente a las conferencias de la, de la serie de eh, el seminario Online Talks que hacemos eh, cada mes. Eh, gracias a la colaboración con Miriam Cubas de la Universidad de Alcalá y a Harry Robson de la Universidad de York. Eh, estos seminarios se organizan desde la Escuela Española de Historia y Arqueología en Roma y por lo tanto también damos las gracias a su dirección y a todos los colegas que tenemos en la escuela y especialmente también a nuestro técnico eh, en la parte de, del YouTube que se llama Mateo Benati y que aunque nunca está visible siempre está ahí. Bueno, hoy tenemos el placer de eh, tener eh, a Sara McClure. A nosotros nos hace mucha ilusión porque la conocemos desde hace mucho tiempo y la verdad es que bueno, es todo un placer eh, poder tener hoy su, su, sus amplios conocimientos que tiene sobre todo en la parte mediterránea. Ahora la presentaré un poco en inglés, con mi mal inglés, pero espero que al menos se comprenda. Bueno, Sara is an Associated Professor in Anthropology at the University of California, California in Santa Barbara. She is an uh, environmental, oh, this is difficult for me, environmental archaeologist and her research centers of the social and ecological impact and legacies of early farming populations. She approaches the transitions to agriculture comparatively by studying two main uh, areas in the Mediterranean region, um, in the Eastern Adriatic, in Dalmatia, Croatia, and in the Western Mediterranean in Valencia, Spain. Uh, prior to joining uh, the faculty of uh, UC Santa Barbara in 2019, she was a professor at the Pennsylvania State University at the University of Oregon. Um, thank you, Sara. You have more or less 40 minutes. Uh, and, and after, uh, if there are uh, questions in the YouTube, uh, I communicate with uh, you, or if not, Miriam o, o Mia a make some question, ¿ok? Super. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk um, and for setting this all up. Um, it's a great pleasure to zoom into you um, from Santa Barbara, beautiful UCSB campus here, um, the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Chumash. Um, today, I am going to be talking to you uh, about research that we've been doing over the past decade in Dalmatia on um, the Croatian coast. And to set up this talk, I thought um, I would talk a little bit first about uh, what, how my approach is formed um, to perhaps then give a, a bit of a better context um, for what it is we're trying to address in terms of livestock management and com community cohesion. Um, so, um, my research is focused in on um, the interplay between complex human systems and complex natural systems. Um, as Juan mentioned in his introduction, I, am, I consider myself an environmental archaeologist or an ecological archaeologist, perhaps. Um, in that I look at um, how complex human systems, organization of human systems, subsistence, interactions between different groups and movement, how that interplays with the natural systems in which they find themselves. So issues of biodiversity and climate, water, ecology, and how both of these, um, these two entities um, are mutually um, influential. Uh, one way that I've looked at this uh, more specifically is thinking about early farming populations, early agro-pastoral populations, and how domestic animal management and the translocation of species uh, influenced local environments and created new baselines for ecological legacies that subsequent human societies had to deal with. So one place where I've been uh, working for several years is on the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, and um, more specifically with my colleague Emil Podruk from the uh, Šibenik City Museum. Um, this was when we were still, uh, when I was still at Penn State, hence the uh, Nittany Lions swag. We need to take some new photographs with some Santa Barbara gear, um, I believe. <clears throat> 
Um, but Emil and I have been working together on uh, issues of the Neolithic uh, in this region uh, for just over 10 years. And more specifically, um, we have done a series of projects um, that have been funded through both the National Geographic Society as well as the National Science Foundation um, to do exploratory work. Uh, so this included archeological survey and test excavation, um, as well as working up old collections or older collections um, of faunal remains. And uh, these projects have been ongoing and consists of many, many people. So um, I am presenting this work today, uh, but I want to acknowledge that this is, has been a group effort um, from the get-go. Okay. So to give you a little bit of um, um, sort of way markers in, in time and space, Right around 8,000 years ago or 6,000 BC, we see the appearance of um, farming societies on the Dalmatian coast. These include villages that have pottery production, um, particularly impresso pottery, um, as well as domesticated plants and species, uh, plants and animals. So these domesticated species uh, consist of the typical European Neolithic package. And I'm going to be focusing in mostly on the, um, on the livestock component of that. So the cattle, the pigs, the goats, and the sheep. Um, there are cave sites, um, open air villages, rock shelters uh, throughout this region. Um, and on not only on the, the mainland coast, but also on the islands. And it provides a really wonderful record for us to look at both the arrival of these domesticates um, into this environment, as well as how farming became established over time. Now, although these um, arrows here uh, are pointing from the general Near East, um, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that um, some of the earliest farmers or a good chunk of the earliest farmers actually likely came from Italy um, and settled from, from uh, the other side of the Adriatic. So what we know about um, the Neolithic in this region is with, there are numerous sites. Um, there are over 30 uh, documented villages. Um, many were built within sight of each other. Uh, here's a map of just some of the, the um, more well-known ones. Um, some of these villages have been known for a very long time. So for example, uh, the site of Crivace was excavated first in the 1960s. Um, we returned to it in uh, 2013 to um, do some small scale test excavations. Uh, there was also some work done in the early 2000s there, and we'll actually be returning to Crivace with a new grant uh, that we have um, from the National Geographic Society in April of, uh, of the coming year. So we'll be doing conducting new excavations there as well. Um, some of these sites, however, um, are also just known from either surface scatters or uh, small um, small test trenches um, and have not been excavated in extension. Um, what we can say about these villages though, is that um, there's evidence for full-time agropastoralism from the earliest onset of uh, the appearance of domesticated um, species on the landscape. So um, down here, I just have a, a very rough timeline um, to help define Again, uh, the, the chronology. So we have the early Neolithic, also known as the Impresso period, um, where we have uh, the first appearance of uh, farming in this region. Then we have uh, the middle Neolithic, also known as Danilo, where we have a um, pretty significant shift in ceramic technologies, new kinds of ceramics, uh, different types of technologies uh, that emerge. So this includes uh, what's known locally as figolina, um, a high fired buff ware that is painted, as well as then um, the typical Danilo pottery, um, which is always dark fired and, um, and carved. Um, 
as well as some unusual forms, uh, such as the writing that you see down here, this uh, footed vessel with a very distinctive handle. And then for the late Neolithic, um, we have very good evidence from only one site, uh, one excavated village site called uh, Velishtak. You can see it here, Chistamala Velishtak in the map. Um, and this late Neolithic period um, is well documented elsewhere in the Eastern Adriatic, uh, mostly in caves and rock shelters. Um, but in terms of looking at um, village farming practices, um, we have wonderful evidence from Velishtak. So Emil Potruk has been excavating there for over 12 seasons, I believe, um, and in, in beautiful extension. Uh, but we only have the one site currently um, that has been excavated. So part of um, the original research design was to try to get a handle on uh, the chronology. Um, so we spent a lot of time uh, working on um, radiocarbon dating, uh, short life samples, so both faunal samples as well as seeds. Um, and one site in particular has been a key site for this effort. And I'm just going to go back to this one uh, to highlight it here. And this is the site of Pokrovnik. Now Pokrovnik um, was excavated multiple times by multiple people, um, but the, the samples that we have focused in on um, were excavated in 2006 uh, by Marco Mendusic and Andrew Moore. And this site is uh, particularly interesting to us because we have a uh, vertical stratigraphy um, that includes both the Impresso as well as Danilo uh, phases. Many of these other sites are on, on the surface appear to be as single component sites, but what um, has been demonstrated by my colleague, uh, Christina Horvat um, and others, is that there appears to be a clear horizontal stratigraphy to many of these sites, where over time, um, the, the settlement core actually moved horizontally as opposed to um, being houses being built on top of each other. So P Pokrovnik is a bit unique um, in, in that sense. What Pokrovnik and the material from Pokrovnik has allowed us to do uh, is to look at changes through time in a single location. And I'll get back to that in, in just a moment. So in this case, um, we spent uh, a, a lot of time and effort building chronologies, uh, particularly trying to untangle changes in ceramic te technologies through time. Um, and what we found is that um, what's typically sort of lumped together as uh, middle Neolithic uh, pottery or Danilo pottery um, has, does have some phasing to it. Um, where uh, Figolina actually comes in uh, earlier than some of the other um, more typical Middle Neolithic um, pot pottery types. In terms of livestock management, um, the last several years we've been focusing in on the faunal assemblages from six locations, the ones that you see here, uh, Krivace, Velishtak, Rashinovets, which is another early Neolithic site, um, Pokrovnik, Konyavate, and Danilo. And um, we were able to analyze over 41,000 faunal remains that span the early to late Neolithic. Although I will sort of continuously highlight the caveat that the late Neolithic consists of only one, one site, Belishtak. Not surprisingly, if you work in the Neolithic and the Mediterranean, we have mostly sheep and goat, um, but there are some inter interesting shifts over time in other uh, domesticated species, particularly increases in, in cattle and pig through time. And we argue that we are seeing some interesting shifts, what we think are interesting shifts in management strategies throughout the Neolithic. So um, what I'm going to be presenting to you next are the results of this faunal analysis that um, is uh, coming out in Quaternary International, um, hopefully like next week. Um, and summarizing um, sort of the, the main components of our findings. <laughs> 
So when we look at the relative percentage of, um, of sort of four groups here, we have uh, in the dark is our cattle, uh, in the darker gray is our sheep or goat, in the lighter gray is our pigs, and in the um, lightest shading are um, cervids or deer. So these are mostly uh, capriolus capriolus or roe deer, um, but also some red deer are within this category. What we see when we break it down to um, the different sites is um, we have across the board a dominance of sheep and goat, but the relative percentage of sheep and goat varies. It varies by site and it varies by time period. So in the early Neolithic, we have um, you know, over 75% of, the, uh, of the assemblage is sheep and goat. Um, we have very few cattle, so the dark, the um, boss, at these sites. And I will say that at the site of Roshinovats, um, the cattle remains may be inflated uh, because it was a pretty small assemblage and cattle bones are big and um, more easily identifiable in, uh, in many ways. Um, so this may be a, a little um, inflated uh, and more work at Roshinovats um, will likely change these numbers um, in the future. Uh, Roshinovets is actually one of the sites that we found on survey. Um, so back in 2013, and we only did a small test excavation there, a two by two meter um, trench, test trench. Um, so this was a site that was not previously um, excavated and uh, we're hoping to be able to go back and expand that a little bit more. The radiocarbon dates that we have from Roshinovets place it among the earliest Neolithic sites uh, in the Eastern Adriatic. Um, in the middle Neolithic, um, we see a slight decline, especially at some of the sites like Krivace and Danilo um, in Ovacaprids, and a concurrent increase in, um, in the, the cattle there. Um, I want to point out that we also see um, pigs and at higher levels than we did previously. So during the middle Neolithic, there appears to be an increase in some uh, pig management as well. And then finally in Velishtak, our only late Neolithic site, um, we have a quite significant increase in, uh, in the cattle and the uh, ovocaprids, although still the dominant domesticated species and the dominant species in all of the assemblages, um, are actually less than half of, uh, of our identified specimens. Um, so a, a big change from some of these earlier Neolithic sites. The other thing that I want to highlight is that we also have across the board um, a significant proportion of cervids, uh, roe deer primarily, but some red deer as well, um, that for the most part throughout the Neolithic, um, there are, there's more evidence for hunting than there, or for, for deer um, in these assemblages than there are for pigs and in some cases for cattle as well. So throughout the Neolithic, we have about 10%, eight to 10% um, of the faunal remains are, um, are deer, indicating that there is um, some consistency in the uh, hunting activities of these earliest farmers on this landscape. Um, I'll get to some of the age data uh, in a moment, but one thing that I will say about um, the hunting of these animals is that we do see a shift in the timing, uh, or I should say in the age of the animals that are hunted. So the age of the roe deer, um, suggesting shifts in seasonality of hunting activities by these farming populations. Um, this triplot uh, graph here is just a, another visual representation of the three main uh, domesticated uh, groups. So our sheep and goat, our cattle and our pig, um, showing um, sort of plotting out the relative percentages within uh, domesticates um, at these different sites. And so here again, you can see that um, this star is Velishtuk um, and it is, um, located in a very different uh, tripod space uh, 
than uh, the early Neolithic sites that you see down here, and uh, even some of the middle Neolithic. Okay, um, as I mentioned, uh, Pokrovnik is unique within the suite of uh, sites that we analyzed um, because there are very clear, um, there's a very clear stratigraphy that encompasses both the early and the middle Neolithic. And so we can look at changes at Pokrovnik where um, you know, we're not dealing with a whole suite of different environmental factors or ecological factors or topography um, when we're comparing different kinds of sites, um, but rather looking at how things changed at one location. And so here, um, what we see is um, you know, essentially what I, what I just showed you, um, a slight decrease with the sheep and goats and the increase in cattle, very little pig um, at Pukrovnik, um, and the cervids remain um, pretty much uh, stable here. Um, so this was very interesting to us um, because when we then sort of dove down into um, the age categories for the sheep and goat, um, we started to see some, some shifts and some, some interesting changes. So even though the relative percentage of sheep and goats didn't change very much, uh, the age categories did. Um, so this is uh, just a summary graph of the, um, of the percent of elements, um, so the bones that were fused or fusing um, within the assemblage in different age categories. And these are based on epiphyseal fusion rates um, that Mindy Zeter used, um, looking at different age categories. So zero to six months, six to 12, one to two years and so on. Um, and so what we found is that of the elements that um, fuse early on in a sheep or a goat's life, during the early Neolithic, 90% of those elements were fused, suggesting that animals had survived that age category. Whereas in the middle Neolithic, uh, we had a much larger proportion of animals um, that were unfused. Uh, so where the animals were in that age category when they died. Um, we look at this in the next age category as well. Um, and we see pretty much across the board that um, the assemblage from the middle Neolithic consists of more younger animals. So animals being culled or slaughtered earlier in time than in the early Neolithic. Um, when we compare this with mandible data, which um, I'm not going to go into, into those details, but the mandible data also um, uh, support this, uh, indicating that a much higher percentage of young animals um, were, um, were, were killed, or animals were killed earlier in their lifespan during the middle Neolithic right at the same time, where we also see an increase in cattle. So for the early Neolithic, um, what we argue is that we have mainly sheep and goat uh, husbandry with a focus on meat, um, whereas the middle Neolithic has both an increase in cattle as well as mortality profiles for sheep and goat that suggest dairying. Now, this leads us to a question of, you know, are we seeing an intensification of animal husbandry here? Um, we also looked at questions of transhumans um, and doing stable oxygen isotope analyses on teeth of sheep and goat. Um, and this is based on uh, really sort of the, uh, the interesting scenario where the site of Pokrovnik, which you see here on the red, is on a historic transhumans route. Uh, up into the, the Danara. And here we found that at least in, uh, at Pokrovnik, uh, there appears to be some evidence for um, movement of animals on the landscape, as well as changes in uh, the birthing season, either staggered or um, expanded birthing season. Again, suggesting that there's some pretty fundamental changes in Neolithic animal management.
We also conducted residue analyses on pottery from Pokrovnik. And here we found that the Impresso wares um, had mostly ruminant adipose, some freshwater fish, as well as a little bit of ruminant milk. But that when we get into the middle Neolithic, we see the regular Daniel pottery um, very similar to the Impresso in terms of the kinds of, um, of foodstuffs um, they contained. But with a figalina and with a ritin, uh, clear evidence for uh, milk production and uh, dairying, as well as cheese and fermented dairying products. Um, and we see this in the, in the sibs as well. So it appears that there are some pretty fundamental changes that all of these multiple proxies are, are pointing to the Middle Neolithic being a period of dairying. And in addition to that, there are other indicators uh, in the archaeological record, work that um, colleagues, uh, Nico Masuko and colleagues have, have done looking at harvesting techniques and uh, um, as well as, um, as some preliminary stable isotope analyses on, uh, on the seeds, um, so uh, wheat and uh, barley. Um, that indicate an intensification of farming and shifts in farming practices during the Middle Neolithic as well. So when we look at the faunal record, um, we see that, you know, even though the suite of animals remains the same, largely the same with the um, sort of increased addition of, of pigs, there are other changes that we can document. These include the ceramic changes and also some changes in lithics. So during the early Neolithic, um, much of the chart may very well be from um, the Gargano uh, plain on, on the other side of the Adriatic. Um, we have Figalina coming in sometime at the tail end of the early Neolithic and uh, definitely very prominent during the Danilo phase. Um, we have obsidian, mostly from uh, Lipari. Uh, coming in during the Middle Neolithic, and that stays around for the late Neolithic as well. And we have some evidence for at least milk during the early Neolithic, milk, cheese, and yogurt during the middle, and um, possibly cheese during the late. We don't have any direct evidence for, for that. So these are some pretty exciting results. Um, we're um, very, very pleased about them. Um, but we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and think about livestock management and what these results may be indicating. So for the early Neolithic, as I mentioned, we have mainly sheep and goat husbandry. Um, the middle Neolithic, we have um, some mortality profiles um, that suggest dairying at least at one village. So on this graph, uh, you can see the data for Pokrovnik, Krivacha, and Danilo for the Middle Neolithic. And so the Pokrovnik shows us these um, younger age categories. The other sites don't. Um, the other sites are actually much more similar to the early Neolithic. And I'll get back to that uh, point in, in a moment. Um, so, but for, for Pokrovnik, it does appear that we have these younger age categories and um, suggesting uh, dairying. And then in the late Neolithic, when we look at the age categories, not only do we have fewer sheep and goat uh, relative to other, other domesticated species, so there are many more cattle, for example, um, but there is zero evidence for dairying. Um, in fact, it, this is the animal age groups. These are the oldest sheep and goat um, that we have in any of the, of the available sites. So if we then take a step back and think about, okay, so there are these big changes, but what does this actually tell us about livestock management? Um, this then takes us into other kinds of realms, uh, looking at more broadly uh, what we see in the literature and what some of the caveats are uh, for this kind of research. So this is the part of the talk where I start undermining everything that I just said um, about how uh, great or, or impressive all of this is. Um, because when we look at traditional livestock management assessments, um, many of these assessments are based on many assumptions. Um, and these assumptions are largely 
um, based on large or larger scale nomadic pastoralism. So um, this includes site or village-based assemblages, um, models that come from, uh, from ecology um, that focus in on nomadic pastoralism or at least some sort of large-scale pastoralism or pastoralism within larger market economies. In addition to that, we also have issues um, that have been well-documented um, by various people um, that deal with how to reconstruct mortality profiles and the, the need for adequate sample sizes, um, as well as the analytical techniques that are used um, in order to address those. So that we know that analytically there are um, issues about how zooarchaeologists go about um, creating these scenarios for different uh, livestock. And then we can also look to a whole other grouping of, uh, of, of data and, and research that's been done within ethnography and ecological modeling and agent based modeling. And there are two studies here that I think are particularly relevant um, that I want to highlight and discuss a little bit more in detail. Um, the first is work by uh, Mark Moritz and colleagues um, who are, have been working with um, nomadic pastoralists in Africa for, for many years and thinking about the spatial distribution um, as well as the uh, effects of herd sizes and herd stability and risk and risk minimization uh, among um, African pastoralists. So one of their um, really great papers from, from 2017 used in a modeling approach to look at herd size thresholds versus self-sufficient thresholds. Um, and I'll get into that in more, more detail in a moment. Um, they actually used uh, a lot of data from uh, the classic Dahl and Hjort uh, study um, looking at herd sizes. Uh, but they included a human component into their modeling, um, looking at offtake rates and uh, sort of the, uh, not just herds uh, reproducing themselves, but the interaction between humans and herds. Um, and another study that um, I'll talk about in more detail, um, looking at village and regional level pooling of livestock among agro-pastoralists um, in a historic context. So herd stability is something that um, I've been fascinated with. And this paper by um, Mark Moritz and colleagues um, is, is really eye-opening. Um, it is a modeling-based paper um, where they look at the starting herd sizes and model the risk of herd death um, based on uh, a number of different, different factors. And this um, graph here is um, from this paper, um, and it shows the probability that a herd survives as a function of the starting herd size. The larger the herd, the greater the chance of survival. So if you have a starting herd size of 150, you have a much greater chance of survival than if you have a starting herd size of, let's say, 25, um, where you only have really a 60% um, chance of herd sur survival. Now, one of the things though that they make clear in this paper is that there's no magic numbers, even in the title of the paper, no magic number. Um, but the takeaways are the smaller the starting herd size, the greater the risk of herd death. Um, and that even with larger herds, they're always at risk. Um, as they say, even large herds remain roughly as likely to decline as increase between time steps. So they did this uh, iterative modeling exercise. And this really you know, makes me sort of step back and ponder what, what this looked like on the Neolithic landscape. When you have the translocation of species into these areas, you have people moving there, bringing their animals with them. Um, the likelihood that they're bringing hundreds or thousands of animals is fairly low. And, um, and I'll get back to, to that in, in just a moment. Um, but the animals that are there, um, the likelihood of them surviving 
and reproducing over many generations um, is quite a risky undertaking. Um, now, Mark Moritz works with, uh, with living uh, populations and pastoralists in an area um, where uh, there has been a lot of investment uh, in non-government organizations and uh, development plans. And so one of the, the quotes that I think most um, resonated with me at the end of this paper um, talks about the um, efficacy of uh, the of restocking and uh, some of these development initiatives, where they say that quote the scale and stochasticity matter for herd dynamics and for restocking efforts. To be successful, the number of livestock given to impoverished households needs to be sufficiently large to overcome the odds. Otherwise, it might be better to give pastoralists lottery tickets. Now, one way that we've tried to address uh, questions about the scale of, um, of herding and livestock management um, in an agropastoral context, um, was uh, or is looking at um, ethnohistoric records. And this is a, a paper that recently came out um, by my dear colleague, uh, Martin Welker um, and Joanne Hughes that looks at census data um, from the 18th century in what is today Canada, mostly Canada. Um, and really, it's the the uh, the Acadian census data. Now, um, for just a very brief to situate you in time and place, uh, this part of Canada, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Cape Breton, um, this area flip flopped back and forth um, between French and uh, British control over the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and um, the Acadians who were European settlers uh, from France, um, they were sort of the, the receivers of, uh, of these flip-flops. They were uh, people that were on, on the landscape, um, sub mostly subsistence farmers, um, some with linkages to, uh, to the maritime trade um, as well as to some of the, the forts and garrisons. Um, but they were subject to a series of censuses, um, particularly every time that uh, power um, was taken over by a different um, regime. So there are uh, very detailed censuses um, from, from uh, this time period, from the 18th, 18th century. Um, and they include the names, uh, the ages of people within households, the number of cattle, the number of sheep, the number of pigs, urbans of land. Um, so that's a, a land unit that was under, um, under uh, being grown on, um, as well as guns, uh, how many guns they have. And here's just an excerpt of uh, one of these uh, for one village. So we collected um, the, the census data um, from these from published sources um, and have uh, data from over 2,500 agro-pastoral households uh, spanning uh, about 150 years or so. Um, and these data come from 119 settlements. Um, and what they show are some what we think are very interesting, um, uh, interesting patterns. So again, these are agro-pastoralists, uh, translocated species. This is based on, on cattle. Um, so translocated species into these uh, regions in an area that you know, was, was settled by farmers um, and then over a period, period of time. And so when we crunch the numbers, we find that um, there actually weren't all that many animals on the landscape. So if you look at um, the household averages for Acadian households, a household had an average herd size of about eight, uh, eight cattle. There are some um, differences in uh, the different regions of the area that we looked at. So in Cape Breton and New Brunswick, as well as Maine, um, there were fewer per household. 
If we look at this per person, so looking at how many people are within a household and how many cattle, um, you can see here also some differences where Cape Breton has only about a third of a cow per person um, versus uh, Prince Edward Island or Nova Scotia where you have more. Um, Nova Scotia was also much more tied in to the, or the villages in Nova Scotia were much more tied in to uh, some of the maritime trade and um, than uh, in other places like in Cape Breton. If we look at livestock units per person, uh, we can also see uh, some differences there as well. Now, if we look down here at this graph, what this shows is a plot demonstrating the relationship between village size, households owning cattle, and the um, effective population size of village herds. So the small circles are uh, villages that have less than 50 animals in their effective population size, whereas uh, the larger circles are one that have more than 50. And what I want to point out here is that there are a lot of villages that have very, very small numbers of animals with them. Um, when we crunch these numbers um, and we compare them to things like what Mark Moritz and colleagues have done, um, it becomes very clear that these herds were dangerously close to collapse throughout time. Um, and that the only way to even have an effective population, so that means having enough bulls to you know, sire a next generation of calves, could only happen through intervillage interaction and regional interaction. So what does this mean? Um, when we look at this, it makes me want to go back and reassess livestock management in the Neolithic, because we know that largely sedentary farming societies face a number of limitations and constraints, labor, space, mobility. And so there are caps as to how many animals um, a an agro-pastoral household can, um, can handle. Um, herd pooling, cooperative management, and livestock trading are things that other people, such as Kurt Grohn and, and John Robb, as well as Paul Halstead, have talked about in, in, at different times and in different contexts. But what I would suggest, and what we would suggest, is that this should be the a priori assumption for scales of human-animal interactions and decision-making, as well as issues of risk minimization on the landscape. So in order to do this, our village-by-village -village approach perhaps is not the best kind of approach, but rather what we need to do is look at regional scale data analyses. So going from some of the, uh, the site-specific to more time period specific within a given region. Now, what does this do? It doesn't change all that much on sort of the, the broad scale. We still have decreases in, uh, in sheep and goat, and we have increases in cattle as well as in pig. But what it does do is it looks at some of uh, the variation between sites. Um, to question, is this variation meaningful um, from a management perspective? So this variation that we see, I mean, this is variation that's documented, but is it perhaps not because they're actually doing other things? It's perhaps that they're coordinating things. So in other words, perhaps people are bringing their lambs to Pokrovnik or focusing in the lambing season at Prokrovnik and not replicating the same kinds of activities at each site. So thinking about it in terms of regional pooling of activities and management decisions as well. And then the shifts that we see in the late Neolithic, um, could these be due to responses to herd collapse that there are just not, the sheep and goat aren't doing so well? Um, or could it be due to other factors such as human demography or other cultural or environmental factors? And those are all questions that we hope to pursue more uh, in the future. So thinking about community cohesion and how communities interact with each other regionally, um, I think there is a tremendously important role for um, livestock and livestock management to be part of that conversation. 
where it's not just a question about the movement of stone tools or, or ceramics between different areas, but thinking about regional networks um, in, a, in a much more um, sophisticated and uh, fun foundational kind of way. We know that um, these agropastoralists, the earliest ones, uh, translocated um, and likely in the Adriatic and their indicators uh, showing strong ties um, between both coasts of, of the Adriatic. We also know that uh, regionally there's stylistic cohesion in material culture through time, even though there are changes, um, we see similar kinds of changes across uh, uh, Northern Dalmatia. And so one area that we plan on uh, focusing our future work is in the regional interactions between villages and the role of livestock within that. So, and with that, I would like to um, thank all the amazing people who contribute to this research and thank you for your attention today. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for your interesting talk. Uh, if you don't mind, and if you have a little bit of time, because I know that you are living in another time, I have some questions. It's quite interesting the documentation of this kind of figulina pottery. And I don't know if there is any technological study focused on, on this. Do you know any kind of and technological study of raw materials, circulation of this kind of fuel in a pottery? Yeah, there, um, so Michaela Spataro um, mm -hmm. did quite a bit of work um, back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and so she included um, samples from a number of Neolithic sites uh, yeah. in Dalmatia. Okay. Um, one of the things that she um, she demonstrated was that uh, not only sort of the, the technological side of it in terms of the clays being very fine and likely levigated and high fired um, was also that um, the clays were local clays. Okay. And I had a, a graduate student at the University of Oregon, Melissa Teo, who um, did her master's thesis on a number of um, Figolina, as well as like the traditional or typical Danilo pottery um, mm -hmm. from sites in Northern Dalmatia that, that we've been working on. So this includes uh, Smilchich, but she also had um, Pokrovnik and, um, and Danilo um, itself. Um, and so she found uh, in her analysis that um, the clays that they were using were actually the same clays. They were so local clays that they were using, but they were treating them completely differently, yeah. pretty much from the moment that they were um, harvesting the clays um, to then the production of figolina and danilo. Okay, one. thank you. And I have another question um, on the preservation of lipids in this kind of pottery, mm -hmm. because now we have some, some shirts that we assume that are figolina, and we are going to try to analyze them. But in our samples, the, the thickness is too, too, too thick, thin, you know? So I was wondering if the preservation of lipids in these pots will be okay or enough to, to analyze the, the, isotopic, uh, the isotopic values of the palmitic and acidic acid. Yeah, that, I hope so. Um, because, um, so we, I'd have to go back um, and look at the exact numbers. I know that in our overall uh, residue study, we had a, a high success rate. It was about 75% um, mm -hmm. of the, the sherds that we tested had preservation and could be identified. And in part, we um, attributed that to um, the fact that Andrew Moore kept 10% um, of the ceramic assemblage unwashed. Um, so we were able to select shards from, from uh, there. Um, but I don't know the breakdown between the different ceramic styles. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the preservation in figolina was worse or better than in other pottery types. Yeah. That's something that I'd have to look up. But I'd okay, be happy, because uh, I'd be this, happy to uh, 
the organic residue analysis is the one that is published in PLOS one. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't done any more. Um, we would love to do more. Yeah, of course, but, of course. But my collaborators have gone off and decided to do other things with their, <laughs> their research, so yeah. Yeah, because now we are working a lot on this because Juan and me, we are working on this kind of pottery because we don't have a lot of vessels, but we assume that we have at least three different vessels on Figulina. So I was wondering, and you know, I, this bibliographic recording. Mm. So thank you for this because it's really helpful. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions, Sarah. The first is a general question. Um, is uh, if you can speak around where is the Mesolithic people? And there are contacts with the Neolithic. Uh, what do you think? So the Mesolithic record in the Eastern Adriatic is fantastic everywhere except for in central Dalmatia. Um, so, you know, there's wonderful sites up north in Islia, there are wonderful sites down south in Albania and Montenegro and, um, but you get into Dalmatia and we just have not found them. Um, I think in part, so I think that there are two things happening. One, I think does have to do, um, and this is not just a a cop out, but I think um, there is some truth or some reality to uh, the post glacial sea level rise and that Mesolithic sites, the coastal ones, um, mm. are, are probably underwater. Um, mm. okay. That's one aspect. But another, another aspect that I think um, may also be contributing to this is uh, significant erosional processes uh, over the course of the middle and late Holocene, um, where valley bottoms have, uh, have experienced uh, quite a bit of erosion, and that some of these mesolithic sites that are harder to detect are just, that are already harder just to detect, they may have been more ephemeral, um, are under significant sedimentation. Mm -hmm. So at the site of, of Krivace, um, we were, um, we recently, a few years ago, were talking to uh, some, some geology colleagues, uh, and it turns out that Krivace is um, on a paleo lake. Um, and so this, we've been able to do some coring of this paleo lake. It was a lake that existed uh, from about uh, 11,000 uh, to about 4,000 BC. Um, and it has very clear evidence of different phases of uh, inundation and sedimentation. Um, and some of these sedimentation rates are, are quite, um, impressive. Uh, so at the site of Krivace, for example, the area that we excavated um, was under, you know, a good 80 centimeters of uh, modern soil. Well, not just modern soil formation, but there was a calcareous tufa formation uh, from when that part of the site had been inundated for long periods of time, and then there was a soil formation above it. And so as we track the size of the lake through time, um, we can see, well, two things. Um, Emil and colleagues started doing survey around the lake edges and not perhaps not surprisingly have found more sites now that we know that there was a lake and people like living on lakes, right? Um, but that there's also um, these, these depossessional, deep positional processes. So mm -hmm. I think that the, I, I don't know where the Mesolithic is. I think some of it's buried under lake settlements or on these uh, former lake shores that are now, you know, maybe a meter under, um, mm -hmm. under the surface. Um, and others are on the coast underwater. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We have some caves and rock shelter formations uh, on the Dalmatian, on the coastal plain itself. Um, 
However, there have not been Mesolithic remains found like in the Kirka um, uh, River Valley to mm -hmm. date. Um, <clears throat> farther inland, yes, farther north, farther south, but not right where we are. Um, so, and the thing that we do see though, is that these Neolithic villages, man, they're like, boom, Neolithic, they're there. There's from day one, the earliest, earliest sites that we have, they are full-blown agro-pastoralists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, second question is, uh, uh, in the pottery, you found the, um, um, the fish uh, or the uh, residues of fish. But in the fauna remains, you found this, no, okay. No, okay. we have no fish. We have no fish at all. We have um, evidence of, you know, there's shellfish. Um, there's some freshwater as well as uh, marine shellfish. Um, that was in the residues, that was surprising because we didn't expect that. We didn't know to expect it, I guess. Um, the other thing that's surprising though with the faunal remains is um, there aren't very many birds um, mm. at the sites that we, we analyzed. Um, there are a few um, and uh, Umberto Alberella um, has been, been working with us on identifying the few that we have, but uh, not, in, it's more, it's not, significant in, in sort of a subsistence um, uh, sense. Um, some of the other sites like uh, Cernovrilo have uh, much more birds. And what I'm hoping is when we excavate at Crivace again, that we'll have uh, good faunal preservation there as well. We'll be opening up in more extension because it, it being on a paleo lake, there should be all sorts of wonderful birds and migrating birds and uh, you know, all sorts of other stuff that we're just not seeing. It's so dominated by the domesticates. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if there is, there are more questions, Miriam. Yes, sorry, I will check the... No, we don't have any question more on the chat. So, Sarah, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. It's always a pleasure to hear you, you know, and I hope to see you soon. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.